cool. The video ends right away. Interesting. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Darcy. Good morning, Jeff. Yeah, we, we're, we're missing our co-host again today. So we have the other one in. And we don't have any jokes and probably won't talk. Just think she's, yeah. Oh, you think the other one's ditching? I don't know. I'm not really sure. It'll be funny if she's actually ends up in chat. So, yeah, fake Darcy's ditching or real Darcy's ditching. I forget which one's which. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we got my wonderful drawing of Darcy that I did in like 10 seconds. <laughs> Actually, it probably took me more like five minutes. I had a lot of trouble. Uh, oh, yeah, switching the background, I think. You can see around the hair, I got a little black still. But then I really needed to green screen it. And so, things to do. Maybe next time she's missing, I'll improve our drawing. All right. I got something in my eye. Hold on. There we go. We have an exciting show lined up today. I say we. <laughs> yeah, me in the picture. Oh, we lost two viewers once it wasn't announced Darcy wasn't here. <laughs> it was probably like Darcy. She's like, I don't want to listen to somebody make fun of me. Oh, that's funny. I got to see. I got to turn this off real quick. Yeah. So we recorded a show Wednesday um, that is not up right now. It had no sound, so thanks to whoever liked I think somebody liked our uh, episode with no sound. We talked all about staking and some crypto stuff, and yeah, never looked over and saw any of my bars dancing. Ooh, I was thinking about that. Can I drag this to the top? Audio mixer, go to the top. Ooh, doesn't look the same. There it goes. All right, I moved my screen, so the audio was not on, and we got to do a whole hour and 20, well, hour and two minute show without any sound. It was probably one of the best ones ever for most of the viewers, you know, just all you got to do was just watch me click around. It's pretty exciting, huh? But hopefully today's better. I see we got Craig responding. Uh... Oh, we got a Patricia in today. Good morning. Hmm. The one in my software seems a little slower. What's this arrow? Yeah, that's why I don't catch it as quick over there. Yeah, having a little troubles today with the computer programmers. Uh, the staff wasn't awake and ready. Waiting for um, everybody to join. Uh, at the workplace, but nobody showed up. All right, what do we got? Ooh, that's out of order. Oh, no, no, it isn't. There have been, there has been a discovery of strange alien holes on the ocean floor. Noah, who, you know, from ancient times helped lead, uh, you know, the ark around and stuff like that. Um, he built it, I guess, by hand, him and his family. And he found, just recently, asked for suggestions on what these holes could be. Explorers have discovered a mysterious series, or well, now I'm switching words. Uh, good. I'm glad I started on the easier one. Because the perception of reality, of perception versus reality, is a little deeper than... <laughs> Some holes in the ocean floor. Um, so we have, explorers have discovered a series of mysterious, perfectly aligned holes punched into the sea floor, roughly 1.6 miles beneath the ocean surface. And they have no idea who or what made them. The strange holes were spotted by the crew of Noah. And that was probably like the animals were like looking over the side. They're like, hey, oh, no, no, no. You probably, if everything flooded, 
I wouldn't think you need to put the fish on the walk on the boat. So you wouldn't need to have them. So they're swimming around and they're like, hey, there's these strange holes down here. I wonder what they are. And the holes form a straight line and appear at regularly repeating distances and they surround and are surrounded by tiny mounds of sediment. Oh, let's see. Tiny mounds of sediment. I bet this is some sort of animal. But it is perfectly aligned. It's pretty cool. Uh, this isn't the first time the holes have been spotted in the area. Okay, the holes have been previously reported from the region, but their origins remain a mystery. Well, I think I figured out what it is. We'll go back to the article and find out. Scientists have discovered walking sharks. They have caught them on video. So my guess is it's the footprints of these walking sharks. Look, fin shape. Line for the hole. So they're doing like a side shuffle, I think. What do you guys, what does everyone think? We got some little dancing sharks down here doing like dancing some country music, doing some line dancing. Again, here's my evidence. I have a shark. I have an article that says walking sharks caught on video. We'll see that in a second. And I have this beautifully shaped fin right here off the shark that walks and these lines. Think I figured it out? But the scientists, uh, nope, they still don't know what it is. They think it'll take a little longer, so I should probably write into them and tell them what I just discovered. So their own walking shark. See, it's even uh, their same same writers. Let's see if it's the same people. Uh, ben Turner and nope. Isabel Whitcomb. So they need to talk to each other. Hopefully they can hook up and uh, share their stories and then solve the mystery. On a remote outcropping at nightfall on the coast of Papua New Guinea. That's funny. It seems like a lot of stuff happens over there for the ocean. Scientists encountered something amazing. A walking shark. Using its fins to drag itself, the diminutive, diminutive, tan and black speckled shark shimmied across a tide pool that contained barely enough water to skim its belly, moving like a lumbered sea lion as it's dragging its body across the shore. The creature was an alpeque, alpalte, alpalte shark. And it is unique among shark species in its ability to walk on land. Uh, recently, a biologist shared footage of the unusual species during a special for the Discovery Channel Shark Week called Island of the Walking Sharks. Uh, that'd be kind of cool. It would have got me to watch that. The first time. <laughs> it's like, we don't need shark natives. We just got an island of walking sharks. So nobody's talking about my massive discovery. Oh my gosh. I guess I didn't really discover anything. Scientists think that these shark species found throughout the southern coast of New Guinea and the northern coast of Australia, fake news, <laughs> evolved the ability to walk because it helped them forage for food in environments where other sharks couldn't survive. Uh, where's this video at? Let's see my walking shark. We don't want to see this guy talking. Where's my walking sharks? Sorry for scrolling so fast. Let's try to scroll a little slower. Really? I don't get to show the footage. Just talk about this. Oh, now I got my jerky mouse. Hmm. Okay, well, that's what they look like. And since I don't have Darcy here to help me with look, look it up things. I miss her so much. I miss her. Next. 
A small crustacean acts as the sea's bees. The crucial role of insects in pollination of flowering plants is well known, but algo, algal, algal, it's algae, but with an L in the end. Fertilization assisted by marine animals was Hirito deemed non-existent within the, I, I, I can't read the word, but I know what it is. It's interesting. Uh, a team has now discovered that small crustaceans known as iodotes, 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 contribute to the reproductive cycle of red algae and Gracilara, Gracius. <laughs> the scientist findings suggest that the animal mediated fertilization, animal mediated fertilization is much older than once thought. Okay, so that's the same thing I just read. Are sea animals involved in the reproductive cycle of algae? Like pollinating insects on dry land? Well, they've proven this. And so these little crustaceans are just like bees. It's very interesting. So if you don't have them in an area, you're not going to have probably a very good uh, algae sea life. So you don't kill your bees. They don't typically bother you unless you bother them. So, and the, but if you're allergic, you know, do, do what you got to. All right, next we have woodpeckers' heads act more like stiff hammers than safety helmets. Scientists have long wondered how woodpeckers can repeatedly pound their beaks against tree trucks, tree trunks without damage to their brains. This led to the notion that their skulls must act like shock, shock absorbing helmets. Now researchers have refuted this notion, saying that their heads act more like stiff hammers. In fact, their calculations show that any shock absorbance would hinder the woodpecker's pecking ability. I was just talking with my mom about woodpeckers tearing up stuff. Well, they only go after insects. They don't really tear up stuff. But if you got insects where you don't want them pounding, they tear it up. By analyzing high-speed videos of three species of woodpeckers, we found that woodpeckers do not absorb the shock of the impact with the tree. <laughs> wow. Honey, I'm home. How's your day? I don't know. I got a little bit of a headache. I got us some bugs, though. But if their skulls don't act to shock absorbers, does the furious pecking put their brains at risk? It turns out that it doesn't. The deceleration shock with each peck exceeds the known threshold for concussion in monkeys and humans. The woodpecker's brains, smaller brains, can withstand it. For instance, if they were to peck on full metal at full power, oh, says that woodpeckers could make a mistake. For instance, if they were pecked, to peck on metal at full power. But their unusual pecking on tree trunks is generally well below the threshold to cause a concussion, even with, without their skulls acting as protective helmets. So when they analyze a bunch of pecks, they found that the shock to their brains was much lower than even that of humans. So I guess they have a way inside their head that kind of minimizes that. Maybe small brains, a lot of gray matter, who knows? Gray matter is your brain, I guess, right? I don't know. I don't know brain makeup. Exploring factors that may underline how domestic cats can live in groups. For all those cat owners that have only one cat, you should run out today and grab a cat off the street because scientists have figured out how domestic cats can live in groups. New analysis explores the relationship between domestic cat hormone levels, <laughs> gut 
<laughs> microbes and social behavior, shedding light on how these solitary animals live in high densities. Oh, they want you to get more than one. So go and get like three. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, contrary to researchers' expectations from research on animals that typically live in groups, cats with high levels of the hormone oxy, oxytocin do not display bonding behaviors described as socially affiliative. This suggests that this hormone might function differently for typically solitary animals living in groups than for animals that typically live in groups. Hmm. So all the research, they figured out that there's maybe a hormone, yep, that controls if you like living in groups. They also add that low te testosterone and cortisol concentrations in cats enable them to share space and live together. Oh, wow. So if you're not like an alpha male or a female, uh, we'll just say if you're an alpha, then um, you can live in groups, but the alphas don't. Oh, Craig, I brought him back in. We got the two viewers back. I know. They, they were hoping that Darcy would just join at some point. I like Science Daily. It's short, but it's a little sciencey. That one is really just about the, the hormone levels. It doesn't really talk about their behaviors, but if you could test for those hormones, Ron needs friends. Yes. You can send him outside and he can have all the friends he could ever find. A new study suggests that elephant's muscles aren't the only way it stretches its trunk. Its folded skin also plays an important role. The combination of muscle and skin gives the animals gives the animal the vis <laughs> wow. Gives the animal the versatility to grab fragile vegetation and rip apart tree trunks. The research finds that the elephant's skin doesn't uniformly stretch. So that means that they can control probably different parts of it. Uh, the top of the trunk is more flexible than the bottom. And the two sections begin to diverge when an elephant reaches more than 10%. Really interesting. So they also, not only do they use their muscles in their massive trunk, they can use the skin. Pretty cool. So uh, the findings could pr improve robotics, which today are typically built for either giant strength or for flexibility. Unlike the elephant's trunk, the machines can't do both. As an example, the study's authors point to soft robotics. Their fluid-filled cavities allow flexible movements but can easily break when forces are applied. The researchers say the elephant findings, eh, the elephant findings suggest that wrapping soft robotics with a skin-like structure could give, oh yeah, that would make sense, give the machines protection and strength while continuing to allow for flexibility. Study in nature improves our robots and someday we'll just have the best nature robot ever called the Terminator. But animals will outlive the robots. The longest living animals on earth. Tortoises don't even make it into the top 10 of longest living animals. All right. Throw in some guesses. What's in the top 10? Obviously a jellyfish, so you can't guess that. Because this is the immortal jellyfish. I believe we covered that in one of our previous episodes. Or just Link and I were talking about it. Um, the animal kingdom boasts some incredibly long lifespans. That far exceed, well, this gave one away. The whale. The bowhead whale specifically. While humans may have an absolute limit of 150 years, this is just the blink of an eye 
compared with centuries and millennia that some animals live through. And some animals can even stop or reverse the aging process. Oh, a crocodile, good guess. Aging process altogether. Although there are very long living land animals, the oldest tortoise, for example, is nearly 190 years old. None of them make this list. The true age champions all live in water from old to oldest. Here are the longest living animals in the world today. Uh, the bowhead whale, potentially 200 plus years, um, are the longest living mammals. The Arctic and subarctic whales, exact lifespans are unknown, but stone harpoon tips found in some harvested individuals <laughs> prove that they comfortably live over 100 years old. So we tried to kill it, but it just kept on living. Cool. Ooh, a rough eye rockfish. 200 plus years. Are one of the longest living fishes. Fish. And have a maximum lifespan of at least 205 years. These pink or brownish fish live in the Pacific Ocean from California to Japan. They grow up to 38 inches long and eat other animals such as shrimp and smaller fish. Next we have freshwater pearl mussel. I didn't think of that one. That's interesting. I was thinking just like fish and whales and stuff like that. But yep, we got these mussels. Freshwater pearl mussels are bivalves that filter particles of food from the water. They mainly live in rivers and streams and can be found in Europe and North America including the U.S. and Canada. The oldest known freshwater pearl mussel was 280 years old. Wow. Uh, these invertebrates have long lifespans thanks to their low metabolism. You know how when you regret stuff that you did as a kid? I remember when we'd float down the creek and we'd just for no reason break these things open. You know, thought they were cool. And... Uh, now I feel really bad. You could have uh, be killing something that was like 200 years old. So definitely be nice to your clams, mussels that you find in the creek. Freshwater pearl mussels are endangered species. Well, I'm probably it probably wasn't these exact ones. It's probably something else. Cause, but maybe, maybe their populations are declining due to a variety of human-related factors, like me. Uh, including damage, changes to river habitats, depending on according. I, I definitely see not as many anymore. Next, we have the Greenland shark. Huh. So, are the longest living mammals. But then, I thought a shark was a mammal. Maybe I'm wrong. That's why I need Darcy here. Oh, uh, they can grow to be 24 feet. Oh, yeah, they can get up to 272. Live deep in the Arctic and North Atlantic. So it seems like there's a theme there. The long-living mammals live in cold water. And maybe it's because they're not hunted as much. Uh, have a diet that includes a variety of other animals, including fish, marine mammals, normal shark stuff. Uh, do, 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 do. estimated these sharks. They studied their eye tissue. The biggest shark in that study was estimated to be about whoa, 392 years old. Is that one right there? Jeez, almost 400 years old. And the researchers suggested that the shark could possibly have been as much as 500 years old. Yeah, that's, I agree. We don't mess in the Arctic as much. The age estimates came with a degree of uncertainty, but even the lowest estimate was 272. Longest living vertebrates. Yeah, they're not a mammal, I guess. Still make them the longest living vertebrates on Earth. A tube worm. Ugh, a little gross. 300 plus. 
Do worms are invertebrates that have long lifespans in the cold, stable environment of the deep sea? Hmm. Some tube worms living in the Gulf of Mexico regularly live up to 200 years and survive for more than 300 years. Now we got uh, a qual hog clam. Qual hog, isn't that the ones from Family Guy? And they can be up to 500 years old. So we got some mussels and some clams. And they can live super old. Totally respect these things now. I don't, I do eat clams sometimes, but only the cook, like not raw, so that'd just be oysters, I believe. The saltwater species can live even longer than other bivalves on this list. The freshwater pearl mussel. One ocean quahog clam found off the coast of Iceland in 2006, was 507 years old. Wow. Black coral? <laughs> oh my gosh, 4,000 years? And now we're really moving in. I think your crocodile's not going to make it. I don't think he's going to make the cut. Black coral can live up to 4,000. So we went from 500 plus so now we're at the bar is 4,000. I'm sure that immortal jellyfish is going to be at the bottom. Um, corals look like colorful. It doesn't move, but it's still alive. Corals look like colorful underwater rocks and plants, but they're actually made up of the exoskeletons of invertebrates called polyplops. Polypops. Polyps. Polyps. <laughs> Maybe polyps. I don't know. There's no you. Uh, these polyps continually multiply and replace themselves by creating a genetically identical copy, which over time causes the coral exoskeleton structure to grow bigger and bigger. Corals are therefore made up of multiple identical organisms rather than being a single organism. Like Greenland sharks or ocean quahog clams, so coral's lifespan is more of a team effort. Corals can live up to hundreds of years or more, but deep wa water black corals are among the longest living corals. One that they took off the coast of Hawaii was found to be 4,200 years old. Now we are moving to number eight in the ranker, a glass sponge can live up to 10,000 years old. Sponges are made up of colonies of animals similar to corals and can also live for thousands of years. So as sponges are among the longest living sponges on earth. Members of this group are often found in the deep ocean and have skeletons that resemble glass, hence their name. Noah from Noah's Ark said that uh, it's hard to like switch that into that stupid joke. Uh, Noah, the actual scientific community uh, organization, uh, published a study that estimated glass sponge belonging to species was about 11,000 years old. Cool. And now, oh, here's our number nine. Oh, how's, how do you only make number nine? It's a rock. It's not a rock. It's not a rock. Uh, so we got the Teropitus dorini, potentially immortal jellyfish. They're called an immortal jellyfish because they can potentially live forever. They start as a larva before establishing themselves in the seafloor and transforming into polyps. These polyps then produce free swimming medusas or jellyfish. Then the mature turtotis, <laughs> turtotis, sis, dorini, the stupid jellyfish are special in that they can turn back in to their polyps if they're physically damaged or starving. And then later, return to their jellyfish state. So what do you think about that? They can go from their rock 
to a jellyfish. Jellyfish are native to the Mediterranean Sea and can repeat this feat of reversing their life cycle multiple times. I know. You've been a, you've been an OG. You know about the myrtle jellyfish. Hydra, also potentially immortal. The Hydra is a group of small invertebrates with soft bodies that look a bit like jellyfish. The Hydras also have the potential to live forever. Hydras don't show signs of deteriorating with age. As they reported previously, these invertebrates are largely made up of stem cells, which continually regenerate through duplication or cloning. Hydras don't live forever under natural conditions because of threats like predators and disease, but without these, <laughs> well, that's not really fair. You can't, I didn't hear any conditions. Okay, wait, wait, here's a condition on this one. Oh, yep, predators. That's the, both of these can't live forever because they'll eventually get eaten. Where are these things? Those humans need to take them out, yeah. Well, I think we're doing a good job. Just warm up the ocean. I gotta do. Ooh, that was the last animal one. Next, we have perception versus reality. We're gonna take a quick little break and then we're gonna jump right in to how my reality is different than yours. And then what really is reality? We don't know. We will have to find out.
Alright. Oops, don't roll over my cord. Music. Alright, party people. What are these things? Oh, yeah, that's the last one. I was just checking chat like a good chat checker, moderator, responder, streamer person. I don't know. Whatever. All right. We have perception versus reality. <sighs> very, very interesting topic that I think about quite often. Probably too much. About how people perceive the world around them individuals and then each individual perception is different right and so then you're running around with your own version of reality in your head do we even know what real reality is then because everybody's would be their own and you would have to be an outside like totally an outside force looking in to see what true reality would be could be way crazier than we even think and everybody's living if you've ever watched movies where um oh man what is that one movie oh i can't think of it it's got it's kind of like a split kind of like anime it's like kill bill style but it's not and like this girl's going through some really bad trauma and then every time she closes her eyes she's like a superhero fighter not but super not a superhero but like a, a sword girl person and she's tearing it up, and then, uh, I forget the story, I'm gonna have to find that movie, I like that movie, and, you know, you've, you escape into your own perception of what reality is, and it's not even the same at all, and, and then it'd be like a Matrix style type thing, uh, so each individual has his or her own perception of reality, the implication is that because each of us perceives the world through our own eyes. Reality itself changes from person to person. Yeah, they say. Writers do say things better than I do. Probably why they're writers. While it's true that everyone perceives reality differently, reality could care less about our perception. Reality does not change or adapt to our viewpoints. Reality is what it is. Reality is fact. Reality is truth. Reality, however, is not always known, which is where perception of reality comes in. Reality is a fixed factor in an equation of life. Perception of reality is a variable. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I believe all that or agree or just accept that. We're going to have to see. When it comes to your company's costs, I don't care about my company's costs. Perception is reality. <laughs> really? Wow. I grabbed, this is funny. So this is, I, I try not to read the article, so I read uh, the beginning thing. And then this is all about a product. Uh, that's so funny. Okay, so how, wait, 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 maybe not. This is so f funny, but they're mixing in what I would say is interesting and then like how to sell things. So how do I exactly untangle? How exactly do you untangle perception from reality? First, under, first uncover any issues. Next, consider how they might be perpetuating the problem. When you've exhausted all areas, of their past experiences, then evaluate their responses. <laughs> this is so horrible. Uh, okay, I'm pretty sure. What is perception? So, perception is the sensory experience of the world. It involves both recognizing environmental stimuli, stimuli and actions in response to these stimuli. Through the perception process, we gain information about the properties and elements of the environment that are critical to our survival. Perception not only creates our experience of the world around us, it allows us to act within our environment. I was thinking about it not only allows, it not only creates our experience 
of the world around us. So there's reality and then there's each person's experience of it. And I think maybe we confuse the word reality with experience. That's really interesting. So if you go back to the last horrible article that was just trying to teach you how to sell things or market things, uh, they did have a couple things that were interesting where they talked about, let's just go to the top, that uh, reality is a fixed factor in the equation of life. So then you would have perception and experience that actually sits on top of reality. So reality is exactly what they said. It is what it is. Then each person has their own experience of that reality. And your perception for, helps form your experience. Well, it creates it, they say. Not only creates it, it allows us to interact in that reality. So perception includes the five senses five senses touch sight sound smell and taste and if you've gotten covid a lot of people don't have that smell and taste i think or just taste because i thought they go together uh if anybody wants to tell me what it is um it would also it also includes what is known as pro pro <laughs> pro proprioception proprioception as a set of senses involving the ability to check detect changes in body position and movements it also involves the cognitive processes required to process information such as recognizing the face of a friend or detecting a familiar scent types of perception we just covered that um and there are are also other senses that's interesting so what do they call these now some of the main types of perception and then there are other senses that allow us to perceive perception such as balance time body position acceleration it's kind of interesting that they don't really now they're calling those senses which i i would balance time body position acceleration and the perception of internal states. I guess feeling, figuring out how you feel. Many of these are multimodal and involve more than one sensory modality. Probably causes a lack of taste is more annoying. Yeah. Social perception or the ability to identify and use social, social cues about people and relationships is another important type of perception. Yeah, if you're not good at that, socially awkward is a thing that would be more accurately defined as you have um, low social perception. Need to work on your social perception. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, how it works, the perceptual process is a sequence of steps that begin with environment and leads to our perception of stimulus and action in response to the stimulus. It occurs continuously, but you do not spend a great deal of time thinking about the actual process that occurs when you perceive many stimuli around, many stimuli that surround you in any given moment. Uh, I was also just trying to work out, so I, I mean, Robots, part of their, the interesting thing about the way we perceive AI and robots nowadays, they don't have all the senses. And so then that wouldn't be able to give them any sort of perspective about the environment around them. And do they need that? Because then if they didn't have that, would they be operating on that base layer of reality? Right, we, we were talking about how reality is at the base and then you would have perception and experience sitting on top of that. And does that mean that robots actually don't, since they don't have perception, they could have experience from information. I wonder how that would work, if that counts. Just because you have knowledge, I don't think that counts. If you have knowledge, doesn't mean you have experience. 
Is Craig's the only one talking in chat? What do you think, Craig? <laughs> Can you gain experience through knowledge by reading enough and learning about other people's experiences? Does that count as enough if you're a supercomputer that can, you know, sift through your decision tree so quickly that you can pick out the most absolute perfect thing that, okay, so that does count as experience. So you could, without living the event, yeah, you gain, yeah, but that's insight. I don't know. I don't know if it counts as experience, but it does. If you have all the information, then you would have everybody's experiences. And so you would just have one half of the equations. You'd have no perception, but experience. Then your reality would probably be kind of distorted, maybe. I don't know. Perception acts as a filter that allows us to exist and interpret the world without becoming overwhelmed by the, by the abundance of stimuli. Steps in the perceptual process. The environmental stimulus the attended stimulus, the image on the retina, transduction, neuroprocessing, perception, recognition, and action. Crazy that we're doing all of that in microseconds. And then we go into each of the different things. I'm not going to read each individual one. I want to cover other stuff too. Let's see, tips and tricks. Ooh, take a moment to think of all the things you perceive on a daily basis at any given moment. You might see familiar objects in your environment, feel the touch of objects and people against your skin, the smell of an aroma, the smell the aroma, oh yeah, smell the aroma of a home cooked meal, hear the sound of music playing in your next door neighbor's apartment. All these things make up your conscious experience and allow you to interact with the people and objects around you. Yeah, perception. Do you think then without perception, what would they not have? They would have vision. So you have AI with vision. I don't know if they can feel. What would they not have? They wouldn't have. I mean, you can fake pretty much all this stuff nowadays. I guess they'd have touch because they'd have pressure sensors and stuff. So they could do touch, sound, they'd have sound. So they're just missing taste and smell. And you just put sensors there. Does that mean then they have perception too? I don't know. Terminator's right around the corner. Remember we covered an article about uh, somebody building Skynet and Terminators. Tips and tricks. There are some things you can do that might help you perceive more in the world around you, or at least focus on things that are important. Yeah, yep, Elon's working on it. Oh, Elon! I'm doing like that, like, shrug with the, the arm and stuff. He's just always up to something. What do you think, Darcy? Yeah, there isn't much. It's just, <laughs> you should put across your image out of office. That would be funny. Looks like I need to resync real quick. Give me a sec. Yeah, minimize that. Uh, where is my animes? There we go. Fixed body position a little bit. All right. Here's what you can do to help perceive the world around you better. Pay attention. <laughs> Darcy is missed. I know. It's so sad. <sighs> we don't get our viewership. Like nobody's talking in chat besides Craig. And Craig just, he's hes paid. You know, so. And then he's going to be like, where's my money? <laughs> um, I have to, I pay him in love. And, and, and grandma, grandma does it out of love too. And that's, that's all we have. It's just my paid, my paid moderators, food, paid and food. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. You, you bring food sometimes. Boat rides. Yeah, yeah. But then I put you to work, so then you don't get to ride in the front that often. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, it's like more when Amber comes, and you get the you get a little bit of time off. But then you got to drive. See, you're always having to work. Then so now you're having to be a moderator. Oh my gosh, it's just horrible. I need to treat you better. But pay attention. Perception requires you to attend the world around you. Don't be tuned out. Look at everything. Exercise that brain. This might include anything that can be seen. Oh, definitely don't lick things. And don't touch a lot of things. Ooh. I'm not perceiving my world very well. Smell here. Those are fine. But touching and tasting. Is that why people lick things? Like everything? The liquors? It might also involve the sense of proprioception such as the movements of arms and legs or the change in position of the body in relation to objects in the environment. I need to look that up, that word, because I don't know if that's looking at other people or yourself. What time is it? 8.55? Otherwise known as, is your body's ability to sense movement, action, and location. It's present in every muscle movement you have. Without proprioception, you wouldn't be able to move without thinking about your next step. Oh, very interesting. So it is yourself. I gotta go find my tab that I was on. It might also involve the subs of proprioception. Proprioception, 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 huh? Controlling the, that's like ninja warriors. They are experts at proprioception. That's exactly what, that's where they excel, huh? Might uh, make meetings, make meaning of what you perceive. Yeah, this is organization in your brain. The recognition stage is an essential part of perception since it allows you to make sense of the world around you. By placing objects in meaningful categories, you are able to understand and react appropriately. This is totally what I talk about. Uh, you categorize stuff in your head, you put it in categories. Sometimes the details aren't as important, but categorizing your information in your brain is so important. You gotta, that's how you lock it away. And then, then remembering the details on top of that and then refreshing it. And, yep. uh, take action, the final step step of perceptual process involves some sort of action in response to the environment <laughs> don't let the <laughs> this is where ron's so funny uh you throw his little mouse at him from up on the he just lets it hit him in the face it's <laughs> pay attention totally watching totally uh recognizing uh Everything that's going around, classifying the information, but then he doesn't take action. Uh, he fails at that step. That's the best. I love it. And sometimes he swings, but not not all the time. He, he definitely, and he doesn't, I guess he doesn't categorize it because he lets it happen over and over. Uh, potentials pitfalls. All right. The perceptual process does not always go smoothly, and there are a number of things that may interfere with perception. Perceptual disorders are cognitive conditions. Ooh, here we go, yep. That are marked by impaired ability to perceive objects or concepts. Is ADD gonna fall into it? It very well might. Uh, some disorders might include, might affect perception include Spatial neglect syndromes, oh yeah, which involve not attending to stimuli on, <laughs> that's the Ron story, on one side of, oh, just on one side of the body. Oh, that's weird. It's like uh, stroke stuff. Pros prosopagnasia, a disorder which makes it difficult to recognize faces. Uh, I have the ability like uh, not not the ability, the inability to put names to faces. Alphantasia, a condition characterized by the inability to visualize things in your mind. Oh my gosh. Wow. I hear this all the time. I do a really good job of visualizing things and 
that's where and but I can't describe it very well so I can visualize in my mind really well but I can't vocalize it I can't express it and then I get frustrated I get really frustrated on that and so then the other side of it would be you can't visualize it well you might still be able to say what's in your mind that would be probably different but not being able to visualize things that would make things tough it really would hmm Really interesting. That, well, hold on. Let me copy this. I'll put this at the end. Yeah, that's really interesting. I want to read more about that. Uh, schizophrenia, which is marked by abnormal perceptions of reality. Definitely. ADD would, I would say, would fall in it. They were going a little more severe. <laughs> <laughs> than ADD and like severe ADD is really really serious too and that would be you might be able to not pay attention very well and then does that mean that, and you can't also take the time to maybe make meaning out of what you perceive that I take action part I don't really imagine would be much of a problem but then your your basis your base would be a little corrupted the interest in perception date back dates back to the times of ancient Greek philosophers who were interested in how people know the world and gain understanding. Ooh, that's another interesting one. So now we've separated out understanding of that reality base later. So if you're building a computer architecture, so you're building your AI, you need your AI, where would they sit? Would perception sit on top of understanding and experience? Or would it sit on the same level? I wish I had a quick little way. I gotta get better um, at being able to draw stuff. And we could do a little architecture thing and then it would maybe see how that applies to current AI models. And then who knows, maybe our community here on Pretending to Program has come up with a new way to make the computer smarter. And then they will talk about us in the history books, how we, Craig and Patricia, since no one else is talking, started Skynet, the real Skynet. We'll call it Ocean Floor Net. So it's just the opposite of Skynet, I guess. Or Earth's Core Net. I don't know. Kind of keep net in it. Any ideas? What's our company's name that's going to take over the world with AI robots? What you experience may not exist inside the strange reality. Whoa, butchered that. What you experience may not exist inside the strange truth of reality. What our senses allow us. To, what our senses allow us to experience may not reflect what actually exists. It may be a creation of our own consciousness or a computer simulation designed by super intelligent beings. Can we perceive reality? That's what we were just talking about. I don't know about you, but I feel that I have a perfectly good perception of reality. Anybody that says that doesn't. Inside my head is a vivid depiction of the world around me, replete, replete with sounds, smells, colors, and objects. So it is rather rather unsettling to discover this might all be a fabrication. Some researchers even contend that the live stream movie in my head bears no resemblance whatsoever to reality. 100% just talked about that. And we agree. Well, at least I do, because no one else said they agree. Uh, in some senses, it's obvious that subjective experience isn't the whole story. Unlike, oh, humans, unlike bees, don't normally see ultraviolet light. Definitely right there. We can't sense the Earth's magnetic field, unlike turtles, worms, and wolves. Are deaf to high pitch, high and low pitch noises that other animals can, t can hear and have a relatively weak sense of smell. Wow, now they just trashed on everything we just talked about. And that is all true too. So we really don't do a very good job of perceiving the world around us. And every, and the animals and different things that we just talked about, 
they probably lack in different areas too of perception. So their perception of the world may not be 100%. So then that's where the reality layer down at the very bottom, what reality really, really is. And then everybody's perceptions, experiences, abilities on top of that. <laughs> on top of this, our brain presents us with only a snapshot. If our senses took in every detail, we would be overwhelmed. Did you notice the last time you blinked or that fleshy protuberance called your nose that is always in your peripheral vision? No, because your brain edits them out. A lot of our senses are doing, are doing, wait, a lot of what of our senses are doing is something like data compression, simplifying in order to be able to function. If you're not familiar, they don't process all the data, they compress it. Well, some things try to read raw data. In fact, most of what you see is an illusion. Our eyes aren't all seen, but capture fleeting glimpses of the outside world between rapid movement called saccades. During these, we were effectively blind. Oh, during these, we are effectively blind the brain doesn't process the information that comes in when they happen. If you doubt this, stare into your own eyes in a continue reading. Oh my gosh, how did I let this slide by? I thought I grabbed all this, but at least the first part gets us talking. It's really interesting that this puts it into perspective. A second ago, we were talking about, okay, we have a perception layer and we have our experience, and then we added understanding. Now, if you expand that, there's all these other things going on in the world that we can't even sense, that we gotta have uh, sensors and machines and other things to be able to detect like the Earth's magnetic field or different levels of light or different pitches of sound, and then that means we aren't even getting all the information. I guess then the robots would have more information than us if they had their sensors reading what we call our senses. And then they would be stronger. They don't even care. They'll just be able to take us out. All right, let's see. I need a little bit of coffee. What's our next one? Oh. Well, yeah, because then we're going to move on. Yeah. Cool. Oh, was this last one? I think the last one was New Scientist, so we probably won't get to read very much of this. Yeah, <laughs> they cut this one off fast. The disconnect between young people and nature is appalling and a major issue that society needs to address, says the award-winning con conservationist Jane Goodall. I remember watching her live with apes. Well, we'll just go with generic apes. I think that's what Darcy taught me last week or the week before. I can't remember when Darcy's actually been on last, but she did teach me a thing the last time we chatted where to generalize the monkeys and stuff and call them apes. But I forget what Jane Goodall actually lived with. I think it was gorillas, right? Anybody remember? I remember watching a lot about her as a kid. Watched a lot of National Geographic. I don't know uh, if it was just the only one of the only channels, but I remember National Geographic was a very popular thing. And it wasn't because of what some uh, people with their minds in the gutters may think. We thought it was chimps. Okay. okay. Yeah, it could have been chimps. Um, but she's famous. Oh. <laughs> just read the next sentence <laughs> did you read the next sentence for me there uh jane goodoff famous for her groundbreaking field work on chimpanzees says she welcomes i guess i didn't pay attention when i watched her craig dig i think you had the national geographic magazines isn't that true or are you just answering nope to the national geographics i don't know which nope that's to uh yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. You had National Geographic. Um, but more education is needed to help engage with nature. Oh, so I thought this was how 
young kids and older people and it was going to talk about um time perception and then it also applies to the animal world but guess not all right quick quick break and then uh we'll be back let's see i'm just gonna turn on the music and i'll be back in a sec During sleep, the brain's reaction to sound remains strong. Well, of course. I thought, like, that probably dates back to us just trying to survive. But one critical feature of consciousness, attention, one feature of consciousness, attention disappears. All right, I don't know. It's hard for me to understand. Uh, the new research may provide a key to a scientific enigma. How does the brain, how does the awake brain transform sensory input into a conscious experience? The groundbreaking study relied on data collection from electrodes implanted for medical purposes deep in the human brain. <laughs> no, they did it for torture purposes. Oh my gosh. Uh, the information was utilized to examine differences between the response of the cerebral cortex to sound in sleep versus wakefulness at a resolution of single neurons. Wow, that must have been really deep in the brain. A new discovery from Tel Aviv University may provide a key, provide a key to a great science. Yeah, okay. Researchers were surprised to discover that the brain's response to sound remains powerful during sleep in all parameters but one. The level of alpha beta waves associated with attention to the auditory input and related ex expectations. This means that during sleep, the brain analyzes the auditory input but is unable to focus on the sound or identify it and therefore no conscious awareness ensues. What? So you hear it, but you don't do anything? Or you're only listening for a very particular thing, like for moms or parents listening for their children's cries, their screams during the night as the monsters come out of under the bed. You know, watch your, watch the awesome movie, Little Monsters. Uh, the study was like, uh, well, I wouldn't call it awesome. I don't know if it still stands the test of time. I, I, I worry about that on some movies. Uh, the study was led by Dr. Hannah. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's about where they were from. The study is unique that it builds upon rare data from the electrodes. Uh, we were able to utilize special medical procedure. The research. Searchers placed speakers emitting various sounds at the patient's bedside and compared the data from the implanted electrons, neural activity, and electrical waves in different areas of the brain during wakefulness versus various stages of sleep. I wonder how much you get paid to do that scientific study. Like before, you just go donate some blood or you take some pills or 
you know, get injected with the stuff. Now they're implanting stuff into your brain and you got to be awake and sleep. Although the team collected data from over 700 neurons, only 50 neurons in each patient over the course of eight years. After sounds are received in the air, the signal are relayed to one station to the next within the brain. Until recently, it was believed that during sleep, these signals decay rapidly once they reach the cerebral cortex. But looking at the data from the electrodes, we were surprised to discover that the brain's response during sleep was much stronger and richer than we had expected. Moreover, this powerful response spread to many regions of the cerebral cortex. The strength of the brain's response during the during sleep was similar to the response observed during wakefulness in all but one specific feature where a dramatic difference was recorded, the level of activity of alpha beta waves. And they are linked to processes of attention and expectation that are controlled by feedback from higher regions of the brain. As a single signal travels bottom up, the sensory organs to the higher regions, a top-down motion occurs. The higher regions rely on prior information that accumulated in the brain, acts as a guide, sending down signals to instruct the sensory regions as to which input to focus on and which should be ignored. Thus, for example, when certain sound is received in the ear, the higher regions can tell whether it is new or familiar and whether it deserves attention or not. Yep, exactly like what we were talking about. This kind of brain activity is manifest, manifested in the suppression of alpha beta waves. And indeed, previous studies have shown a high level of these waves in states of rest and anesthesia. According to a current study, the strength of alpha beta waves is the main difference between the brain's response to auditory inputs in states of wakefulness versus sleep. That's really cool. Except for the electrodes deep in somebody's brain. Next, we have the importance of elders. Woo -woo. Research argues that long human lifespan is due in part to contribution of older adults. In a new paper, researchers challenged the long-standing view that the force of nature, oh, the force, the force of nature, the force of natural selection in humans must decline to zero once reproduction is complete. They assert that the long post reproductive lifespan is just not due to recent advances in health and medicine. The secret of our success, our grandparents. All right. Oh, okay. I go right into it. According to long-standing canon in evolutionary biology, natural selection is cruelly selfish, favoring traits that help promote reproductive success. This usually means that the so-called force of selection is well-equipped to remove harmful mutations that appear during early life and throughout reproductive years. However, by the age of fertility ceases, the story goes that the selection becomes blind to what happens to our bodies. After the age of menopause, our cells are more vulnerable to harmful mutations. In the vast majority of animals, this usually means death follows shortly after fertility ends. But there is a saving grace, which puts humans and some species of whales in a unique club. Animals that continue to long live long after their reproductive lives end. How is it that we can live decades in selection shadow? <laughs> so then <laughs> we've escaped natural selection. It's kind of funny. It's like all the animals like that uh, die right after they reproduce. Which is horrible. Or the ones that kill each other. From the perspective of natural selection, the long postmenopausal life is a puzzle. Uh, and most animals, including chimpanzees, our closest primate brethren, yeah, Jane, that's why she was studying it, 
is the link between fertility, fertility and longevity is very pronounced where survival drops in sync with the ability to reproduce. Meanwhile, in humans, women can live for decades after their ability to have children ends. We don't just gain a few extra years. We have a true post-reproductive life stage. All right. Uh, okay, here. For example, one of the leading ideas for human longevity is called the grandmother hypothesis. The idea that through their efforts, maternal grandparents can increase their fitness by helping improve the survival of their grandchildren. Thereby, thereby enabling their granddaughters to have more children. Such fitness effects help ensure the grandmother's DNA is passed down. So it's selfish. No, just joking. Uh, and so that's not reproduction, but it's sort of an indirect reproduction. The ability to pool resources and not just rely on your own efforts is a game changer for highly social animals like humans. Totally true, makes complete sense. In their paper, what do you think? What's the audience think on that one? Best hypothesis ever? <laughs> In their paper, researchers take the kernel of that idea, the intergenerational transfers or resource sharing between old and young and show that it too has played a fundamental role in the force of selection at different ages. Food sharing is not industrial. Food sharing in non-industrial societies is perhaps the most obvious example. It may take up to two decades from birth before people produce more food than they are consuming. Uh, blah 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 studied uh, blah, blah blah indigenous groups in south america a lot of food has to be procured and shared to get kids to the point where they can fend for themselves and be productive group members adults fill most of this need with their ability to obtain food than they more food than they need for themselves provisioning strategy that is interesting going from just so anybody that makes the comment i just I only I have enough of what I need then I guess you're lying if you have kids because you have more than you need because you have to provide for your kids too and then did that <laughs> were early people I guess you didn't live in as big a groups I don't know because that's that's how we got into our class system because then some hunters were better hunters than others and then they cut more for their family and then eventually that led to the you know structure we have today. Adults fill most of this need with their ability uh, to obtain more food, blah, blah, blah. And our model surplus, the large surplus that adults produce helps improve the survival and fertility of close kin and other group members who rely, who reliably share their food. Viewed through the lens of food production, and its effects, it turns out, okay, how does this go back to the grandmothers? And uh, we show that elders are valuable, but only up to a point, sorry. Uh-oh. Not all grandmothers are worth their weight. Uh, oh no, they gotta, we gotta give them more duties. By about their mid-70s, hunter-gatherers, oh <laughs> Jesus, why are they still, wow, they're 70 years old and still hunting and gathering, that's crazy. Hunter-gatherers and farmers end up soaking up more resources than they provide. Plus, their mid-70s, most of their grandkids won't be dependents anymore. And so the circle of close kin who stand to benefit from their help is small. Oh, but food isn't everything. Ha ha ha, they're only talking about the food part. Wisdom, knowledge, very, very important. Ow, just pinched my finger. Uh, beyond getting fed, children are also taught and socialized, trained in relevant skills and worldviews. This is where our older adults can make the biggest contribution. While they don't contribute as much to the food side of it, they have the accumulation of a lifetime of skills they can deploy to ease the burden of childcare on parents as well as knowledge and training they can pass on to their grandchildren. 
Woot woot for knowledge sharing. What do you think, Darcy? Yep, great. Once you take into account that extra thing, then it's totally awesome. And if you want to read more about this, we'll keep going. Because I've only hit a fraction of my articles. Halfway. I got six minutes left. Will we go to 10, folks? No, we won't. In contrast, chimpanzees who <laughs> represent our best guess at to what humans last known common ancestor may have been like are able to forage for themselves by age five. However, their foraging activities require less skill and they produce minimal surplus. So yeah, they got to learn. Cool. Good job, grandparents. What is the birthday paradox? Well, now that they're living forever, we're going to have lots of birthdays that we go. So we better figure out what this birthday paradox is. How does a group, how, how big does a group, Wow, again, just can't read titles. How big does a group need to be for birthday twins to exist? So is this the birthday paradox? Here is a fun brain teaser. Well, I gotta be able to read it. How large does a random group of people have to be for there to be a 50% chance that at least two of the people will share a birthday? The answer is 23 which surprises many people. How is this possible? So if you get 23 people together, you have a 50% chance of two people sharing the same birthday. Really interesting. When pondering this question known as the birthday problem or the birthday paradox in statistics, many people intuitively guess 183 since that is half of all the possible birthdays, given that there are generally 365 days in a year. Unfortunately, intuition often fares poorly at this kind of statistical problem. I love these types of problems because they illustrate how humans are generally not good with probabilities. Yes, that is true. Leading them to make incorrect decisions or draw bad conclusion. Conclusions. Jim Frost, a statistician who has written three books about statistics and is a regular columnist for American Society of Qualities Statistics Digest, told Live Science. Oh, I think we're going to run out of this. Um, so the counterintuitive results to these problems are fun, but they also serve a purpose. To calculate the answer to the birthday problem, Frost began with a few assumptions. First, he disregards leap years since that simplifies the math and does not change the results by much. He also assumed that all birthdays have an equal chance of happening. If you start with a group of two people, the chance that the first person does not share a birthday with the second is 364 at 365. As such, the likelihood they share a birthday is a one is one minus 364 or probability of a uh, quarter of a percent. If you assume a group of three people, the first two people cover two dates, this means there is a chance of the third person does not share a birthday with the other two. It's just uh, one less, but your percentage goes up to 0.82%. Uh, so 0.8%. The more people in the group, with the greater chances that at least a pair of people will share a birthday with 23 there is a 50% chance, Frost noted. With 57 people, there is 99% chance. Wow. I've received messages from college statistic professors who will make a $20 bet about two people sharing a birthday in a particular statistics class. Given the probabilities associated with the birthday problem, he knows that he is general that he is practically guaranteed to win. But every semester the students always take on the bet and lose. Wow, that is awesome to bet people on things that typically are perceived wrong, but statistically you have the advantage. He says he returns the money but then teaches them. Ah, uh -uh. you gotta teach them two lessons. How to solve the birthday problem? And the lesson of life that people don't, people aren't nice. 
Don't get your money back. You lost a bet. A bet is a bet. It's really interesting. Second, I think they also start with something along the lines of, yeah, and then they go and they do this. <laughs> really cool. Let's see, what do we got? Uh, oh. Yeah, because we got to talk about this real quick. So we got a few more that we're going to do. Yep. Everybody is so excited. South Korea set for first moon mission. By this time next week, South Korea's first metal object that they send up into space. I wanted to call it trash, but I was trying to be nice. Because it's not that they made it and it's trash. It's just like us as humans sending up all this stuff into space. And then it's just like, eh, may or may not work. And we'll see here in a second. South Korea's first lunar probe will be on its way to the moon. The probe, Dan, Dan Yuri, which means enjoy the moon, should arrive at its destination by mid-December. Researchers are eager. Took six years to build and cost 237 oh, billion won, about $180 million. You could buy... With uh, winning that jackpot lottery last night, you could you could have funded this little probe to go up there. And what do they hope to learn? Uh, pave the way for more ambitious. Yeah, they're just it's just like their first thing. Cool. So it will be fairy castles will carry five scientific instruments. The most exciting is the pole cam, which will be. The first camera in lunar orbit to map the texture of the moon's surface using polarizing light. Polarizers are often are popular for observe, observations on Earth, such as studying vegetation, but also have not been sent to the moon. Yeah, of course, you got to one-up everybody else. Well, I guess you could use everybody's stuff that's already there. But astronauts might be able to use asteroid soil to grow crops. So the next time you're eating your food from the store. Oh, you didn't win, Craig. I am so, zero numbers matched. Wow. Did you pick the numbers or did you do a computer? Um, lettuce, chili pepper, and radish plants grew in a mixture of fake asteroid dirt and peat moss. Random. Yeah, you gotta pick your numbers. Astronauts might one day dine on salad grown in asteroid soil. Oh, that's astronauts, not regular people. And then you start getting like weird things. Ooh, crazy. Oh, they're just growing stuff in asteroid soil. A 20, speaking of the trash from earlier, a 25-ton Chinese rocket booster will crash to Earth today. What's the risk? This is the third time a Long March 5B booster has made an uncontrolled re-entry. Well, that's pretty obvious. They don't care. The core stage of the Chinese Long, the core stage of a Chinese Long March 5B rocket is set to tumble uncontrollably back to Earth next week. In a re-entry that China is tracking closely and has said poses little risk. Uh, they launched it. Where's it going to fall? Exactly where it will land is unknown, but it is possible debris field includes U.S., India, Australia, Africa, Brazil, and Southeast Asia. So they're just littering the earth with a bunch of space junk. <sighs> The first stage of a rocket is a booster, typically the bulkiest and most powerful. And that's why it's nice that they're reusing at SpaceX. This is the third time in two years to dispose of its rockets in an uncontrolled manner. Yeah, because it's cheaper and easier. General rule of thumb is that 20 to 40 percent of the mass of a large object will reach the ground, but the exact number depends on the design of the object. What is the risk? Uh, for comparison, he added the likelihood of being struck by lightning is roughly 80 times, 80,000 times greater. So, unlikely, but it's just so silly, silly, silly. Why are we worried? Uh, because 
it's just not nice. Also, if there wasn't enough going on this weekend, we have two skyscraper asteroids that are barreling towards Earth. Both rocks are going to pass us even further than the moon orbits us. But still, we got Chinese rockets being thrown at the Earth. We got rocks being slung at us. <sighs> it's a busy weekend for the astronomers. Two skyscraper sized asteroids are zooming towards Earth this weekend with one making its closest approach yesterday and the second whizzing by today. Um, the first went yesterday at 7 p.m. And um, so, yeah. The, oh, here's another. Ast uh, astronomers estimate that the asteroid measures 400 feet across at its widest point making it about as wide as a 40-story building is tall. This asteroid will safely miss our planet, passing about huh, 1.7 million miles away from Earth, or more about seven times the average distance between the Earth and the Moon. So they're really stretching to make this article, but it is interesting. I wonder, I'd like to see the data of how many asteroids pass that distance or closer to see if this is even that big of a deal. And if you got a telescope, you can look um, at 7.37 tonight, Eastern Standard Time. Both of these close encounters are significantly further than the 22, asteroid 2022 NF, which came 56,000 miles or about 23% of the average distance between the Earth and the Moon on July 7th. That one was a bigger event. Even asteroids, puts it millions, search space agencies, blah, blah, blah. I just want to see if they talked about it. Nope. All right, we're going to end there. It was not that great of a show. I mean, the content was all right, but it's so sad. And I don't have my co-host here, but she'll be back next week, I hope. And if she isn't, then you just have to put up with more of me by myself. I've been trying to convince others to be a temp co-host, you know, like they do on the morning shows or other things. Yeah, I know. We miss Darcy and her, and her awesome jokes, right? <laughs> uh, her jokes are so funny. And then having an eggplant tell them, that's the best. That's the best. So hopefully uh, she'll be back, but she's just traveling the world, living life. You know, while the rest of us are living life, listening to me bore you to death on a Saturday morning. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully it was exciting and fun, but it will get better when she comes back. I can't promise you. I just hope it will. <laughs> and so have everybody have a good weekend. And if you get a chance, like and subscribe, which is, I don't even like saying that. So I'm just going to stop saying it because I really, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Talk to you later. Have a good weekend. Bye.